Good morning. Uh, my name is Genevieve Johnson. I am the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Uh, welcome to a webinar hosted today by the LCC. We're very pleased today to have Brian Powell. He is a program coordinator with Pima County Office of Sustainability and Conservation. Um, before coming to Pima County in 2007, Brian led a multi-year vertebrate and plant inventory project for the National Park Service. And today he's speaking to us um, about Pima County's Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, which has been an iterative process using planning tools developed um, on science-based principles, um, shaped with public input and review, and um, has been refined into proposals that reflect the community's values. Uh, the in really great thing about the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan is, it, is that it is one of its first of its kind, and they've won many, many awards actually for the work that they've done. So thanks again for joining us today, and thank you, Brian, for sharing your work with us. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, this presentation really came out of a conversation that I had with Genevieve uh, a few months ago as part of my um, involvement with the local government working group for the Desert LCC. And I really wanted to use the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan um, as an example of sort of within the realm of possibility for conservation measures that a local government can take. Um, and then Genevieve asked me to, to give a presentation to the, to the broader desert LCC, so it's um, a real pleasure to do that. This is not a uh, heavy science talk. There's going to be a little bit of modeling, so in that way I think it's somewhat different from the desert LCC. But, uh, the other Desert LCC talks, but this is really a talk mostly about where science ends and where conservation begins, where a community and leadership and opportunity really kind of converge to create really a lasting, um, a lasting and robust plan. Um, and uh, now the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan has been in both planning process and implementation for, for almost 15 years. And there are a lot of elements to the plan. I will not be able to cover it all. This is a very, very broad brush presentation about the FCCP and a few of the elements um, that I wanted to present to you today. But know that there's, there are many other talks that I could give and my colleagues could give about the FCCP. Uh, this, again, will just kind of have to be broad brush. And speaking of my colleagues, I do want to really just um, say that, that this has just been a huge effort on the part of many, many people in Pima County. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, tip my hat to all those folks who, who um, have made the SCCP a reality over the years. Okay. So just a brief overview of the talk. I'm just going to give a little bit of introduction to Pima County and then get into the SCCP the biological planning process, um, the outcome, the conservation land system, or the CLS, the open space um, protections that we've, um, uh, that we've instituted in the last few years, and then finally um, talk about the multi-species conservation plan and how that relates to the SDCP. Um, so all of this will be revealed in the next 45 minutes. So here's where we are. Uh, Pima County, of course, in southern Arizona, it is about the size of New Jersey, about the size of New Hampshire. It's, I think it's eight Rhode Islands, four Rhode Island. They always get they always get compared, but we, this is a pretty large county, a population of about a million people, with uh, Tucson as the main hub of activity for Pima County, um, which is uh, one of the largest, thirty third largest city in the United States. Um, it's culturally diverse. Uh, the land ownership is uh, about 85% um, either or either tribal, state, or federal land. Only about 15% of Pima County is is private land. Um, almost half of it is the Hono Odom Nation. And of course, we sit in the Sonoran Desert, right on the edge, actually, of Sonoran Desert. Um, this is a uh, land of uh, incredible biodiversity, um, has a bimodal precipitation pattern, so it's unique in the deserts of the southwest for that, where we get about half of our rain in the summer, 
about half in the winter. We are currently right in the middle of the dry, what we call the dry summer here. Hot days, um, warm nights, winters are mild. Um, and, <laughs> excuse me, as I mentioned, the incredible diversity here. Uh, we have some of the highest diversity of plants and animals in the United States, and there's really kind of two main reasons for that. One is that we have this clash of these biogeographical provinces. We have influences from the Rocky Mountains to the north, the Sierra Madres from the south, biological influences from the Chihuahuan Desert to the east and the Mojave Desert to the west. So really all coming together. And we also have this amazing elevational relief. So we go from the cactus-studded deserts in the lowlands to the pine forest um, at the top of the mountain. So I'm just going to take a kind of really brief tour, really brief um, uh, uh, photo tour here. But we have a lot of endemic species, like the photograph here of the Coleman coral root. So, um, so if we down to lower elevations, we got the the Sonoran Desert Life Zone, cactus forests, and so forth, with occasional water resources, water sources, uh, springs, and, and repairing areas that are um, highly valued for biodiversity and cultural resources as well. Um, and uh, as we move up in elevation, we have uh, Sonoran Desert grassland, semi desert grassland, chaparral, oak woodland. And then finally, we get to the top of the Sky Island Mountains here, and we have pine forests. So today, it's about 100 degrees here in Tucson, up in the top of Mount Lemmon at 9,600 or so feet. It's, uh, it's a nice, cool 79, 80 degrees. Uh, and that's only 15 miles from downtown Tucson. So it's a, I'm originally from Canada, and uh, so I love, uh, I love Canada, British Columbia, where I'm from, for many reasons um, as a biologist an ecologist, as an outdoor lover. I mean, this is just such, the North Desert is such a great, great place to live um, because of this amazing diversity that we have here. So if we look at the patterns of settlement at Tucson and eastern Pima County, it really mirrors that of the western United States where, you know, we have very, uh, very small population here. I think it was in the in 30,000 range in the 1930s, and as I mentioned earlier, we're pushing a million residents in Pima County now. Um, you know, the expansion of the highway system and, and air conditioning has really kind of enabled, enabled this um, incredible um, development that has happened. And that's, a lot of that is now pushing up against natural areas like Tucson Mountains to the west of Tucson. This slide shows the uh, current built environment is in the gray. This is where most of those buildings are currently located. So if we look, if we think about the future, growth is going to continue. Uh, here's some modeling work that we did here at Pima County. Um, and even though the Great Recession has certainly impacted the rate of development here, we still anticipate growth to continue. Folks still want to move to this region for, for the lifestyle, for outdoor recreation, for the environment, for jobs, and all the reasons that people move, have moved to the southwest, they will continue to move here. So here's a modeling for 2025, 2035, and 2045, and, and areas in purple are the model model of development areas. So we will continue to see development. And the question really has been for many years, how do we, how do we balance growth and conservation? How do, we, how do we preserve those lands that we care about, that are the reason people move here, why the reason why we have such pride in the place that we live, with the need for, for continued development. And that is really uh, the, the question that was on a lot of people's minds back in 1997 when the listing of the cactus ferruginous pygmy owl occurred. Now, this is a little owl that 
occurs up in the, uh, the, the lives in the saguaro and ironwood forest, and uh, occurred particularly up on the northwest side of Tucson, where a lot of development uh, was occurring during that time. It's lifting really kind of through the development community and and even Pima County because we do development in terms of roads and sewers and so forth. It really through the development community. Um, into a, a state of uncertainty. You know, how much land would have to be set aside? Uh, what were the monitoring requirements? How long would my project be delayed? Um, and the answer to the question uh, from the side of planning was that we have a couple choices. You know, we, we could sort of deal with this sort of single species issue do what it takes in terms of monitoring, do what it takes in terms of preserving land for, for its, its habitat, and then kind of move on. And that is a very typical response by governments and corporations and individuals to sort of, how do you deal with this single species issue? But the answer um, that, or the, the process that Pima County embarked on um, was one of sort of much greater depth and, and broader vision um, that said, look, we live in a place of extraordinary biodiversity. That means that we're going to have more listings in the future. We're going to have more big males. We're going to have more uncertainty. Um, let's take this opportunity of this listing to create something, something more lasting, something more durable, something that adds more certainty to the development environment, something that adds um, more conservation land to the existing preserve system that will then reduce the need for future listings. And that's really the kind of foundational principle in which the, the SDCP was built. And there are really two main goals, incredibly ambitious goals that were developed at that time. One was related to biological resources and one to cultural resources. And if you read these goals, they, they wow, that is, that is really ambitious. Well, the advantage of, you know, of a government or, you know, entity is we're, we're not going anywhere. And we have, a long, we have the ability to think very long term. So if we think about the planning elements um, for the SDCP, there are really five of them. The first two are related to cultural, the last three biological. And I'm going to touch, I'm going to touch base a little bit later on the on the ranch conservation element in particular. I'm not going to talk anymore really about the historic and cultural resources except to say that that is an incredibly valued resource um, for the citizens here. Uh, it's connection to the past, it's a sense of place, it's a sense of who we are as a, as a culture and community in the various cultures and communities within, within Pima County. So I just want to put a nod to that. And there was a whole planning process relating to cultural resources that I'm really just not going to have time to talk about today. But I'm going to talk about the biological element of the SDCP. Now, the next little section here, I'm going to get into some very, very simple models that may seem really basic to a lot of you folks, um, you know, who, who've been involved in modeling um, processes. But I'm going to give you the punchline here before I even start, which is what we're moving towards. Um, this process was started back in 1999. It finished in about 2001. And the idea here is to build up a biological reserve, sort of this ultimate biological reserve that um, will have lasting power, will have, um, will have conservation benefit, not just sort of pretty maps and not just you know, um, not just need informational pamphlets, but what has real kind of enduring conservation power. So the process was, was, um, was overseen by the science and technical advisory team with a lot of help from county staff and, uh, and, and environmental consultants. And the steps that, that we took were very, you know, standard for broad scale biological planning where we, you know, we planned around you know, an element, we established some goals, we, we gathered information, evaluated it, and then implemented. So these are, you know, standard steps that, that we do a lot in planning processes. And, um, 
And the key sort of focus was regionally vulnerable species. Because again, we're thinking about you know potentials, potential for lifting species. Um, it was sort of whittled down to 55 species, and that this modeling approach would be really robust in that if um, there were another group of species that were captured, that the results would really be very similar. The end result would be kind of very similar, if even if individual species uh, were interchanged with each other. So here's the here's the breakdown by taxonomic group. You can see that you know it's it's very heavily weighted towards riparian and aquatic species, and that's because of the rarity of those environments, the um, the real restrictions and geographic restrictions that are placed on, on animals that require those environments. Um, and so what we did was some very what like you know very basic GIS work back um, back in 1999. Um, but at the time we really didn't have a lot of the base level information. So the next couple of slides will just kind of go through the major um, focal uh, layers that were used to develop habitat models for each of the 55 species. So we use these things like elevation. Well, we had, we did have good elevation maps, but we didn't have a sense for, surprisingly, perhaps we didn't have a sense for all where all the riparian and aquatic resources were. So we had to, we had to do a lot of work to gather that information, as well vegetation. We didn't have great vegetation maps. Particularly um, riparian vegetation maps, so we had to develop those. So, you know, this is again sort of basic GIS stuff where we're we're adding these layers together to create uh, species habitat distribution model. And this one is for the yellow bat, kind of a neat species that um, really loves the. Uh, actually, put this as an aside, just kind of loves palm trees and other riparian trees. Um, those the those palm skirts that you see, the, the dead material that hangs down, this is where these guys like to like to roost. So this is for the western yellow bat. We did this for 55 species. And of course, when you layer those 55 species together, you start to see some patterns. And, uh, and these were some areas of, of biological importance are starting to, starting to come out of this, uh, um, out of this planning process. In addition to species, we also thought about what we called special elements. And these were areas um, like talus slopes, a picture in the upper right, or uh, aquatic and riparian and spring systems, a picture in the bottom right. Um, now, we also thought about landscape linkages. And that, now, uh, Desert LCC folks, most of the talks that we, uh, most of the things we talk about, it seems like, is climate change. And um, at the time, climate change was considered in the process, um, but mostly from sort of a landscape linkage perspective. That is, that if we can, um, you know, identify areas of important linkage, um, that species will be able to move and they'll be able to move in up, up and down elevation. So I suppose if this planning process occurred, you know, today, we might place a greater emphasis on climate change, but, but a lot of those principles were really captured in the landscape linkage element to this planning process. So also thought about recovery areas, and then TNC um, with some other folks identified some areas for conservation within Pima County. And the grand result of this modeling exercise was is uh, what we now know is the Nadine Marie Behan uh, uh, Conservation Land System, or the CLS. And just a quick note about uh, Nadine. Uh, she was really the architect of this process. Uh, just an amazing person. She tragically passed away a few years ago. Um, but, uh, but just a, a driving force in this process that, um, that resulted in this map. And, Map has lots of colors, and um, but the power of this map is that it was uh, integrated into the 2001 comprehensive plan for Pima County. Now, in Arizona, um, every 10 to 15 years, counties need to 
um, develop and pass a comprehensive plan. We actually just revised our comprehensive plan just a few weeks ago here in Kenny County, but um, this is for th this comprehensive plan really lays out the you know future for how a county will exercise its various authorities and particularly related to land use authority. So what's really unique about this map is that we took this biology, we took this, this robust biological map, we layered them on top of each other, we identified areas of high biodiversity, we then took that information into the CLS and into the comprehensive plan. And what do I mean by that and the power of that is that and if um, one of the one of the just as an aside, sort of one of the greatest authorities that a county has, um, statutory authorities, is land use decisions. So that when uh, someone wants to, for example, develop 100 acres of land in um, in an area of this dark green area, for example, I'm hoping you all can see that, but it's called the biological core area. This is one of the areas that are identified as high biodiversity. Now, if a developer wants to develop there, they go before the Board of Supervisors to change the zoning, and they are allowed to develop their land. But there is a recommendation as part of the CLS that if that development occurs in BioCore, that 80% of the land is set aside for open space. If it occurs in the light green area, it's 66 and two-thirds percent. If it occurs in the dark blue area, it is 95% needs to be set aside as open space. Now the areas in white, exclusive of the Tohono O'odham Nation, um, these areas in white are actually out, what is called outside of the CLS. And in those areas, we actually don't require any, not require, but recommend any set aside. So that um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create a more compact urban form, we want to encourage the more dense development to occur in those areas. We want to provide linkages through developments in, in the hinterlands, not hinterlands, you know, areas in green, um, so that species can move across the landscape as needed. So again, this is one of, <clears throat> this is one of the really, really important things about this plan is that it takes a biological foundation and incorporates it, <coughs> that biology into how the county makes land use decisions. And that's the true power. And that's, <coughs> excuse me, one of the, <coughs> sorry, just a moment. And that's one of the things that's really unique about Pima County and the surrender of the conservation plan and how it sets it aside from other, um, from other county comprehensive plans and how other counties in the western United States uh, do business. Okay, so um, I do want to say that in addition to the biological planning element, there was also what was known as the steering committee, a very large committee. Um, whoever wanted to join the steering committee could, but they had to go through a lot of meetings and if there's any folks um, out there who are listening to me right now who are on the steering committee, you know, there was broad representation. There was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of contention in this um, element of the plan. There was a lot of, there was a lot of debate. There was a lot of information sharing and there was a lot of relationship building. And um, this was an, a, a really important part of the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan was really getting out into the community, having conversations about what conservation means, what are the conservation benefits. Um, and um, a lot of people, you know, uh, got a great deal out of that process. I'm not going to really kind of go into nitty gritty details of that, but it was a, it was a very important part of the SDCP planning process. So we have really kind of two main elements of the FDCP. We have the conservation land system and the and and the way that uh, that CLS informs land use decisions, not just on the private development side, but also um, you know on, on other things that the county does. Now, there's also land acquisition and protection 
side of the equation for Sonora Desert Conservation Plan. And we recognized back in the day that we really had our last good chance as, uh, for acquiring large um, blocks of land. Um, if we think about the future, a lot of those lands were in ranches, but we had an opportunity to, to create, to add to the reserve systems that you could see in Peru, which are primarily uh, federal lands, uh, BLM lands and Forest Service lands, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service lands. So the areas in red are lands that the county owned prior to 2004. And so the areas in green are areas that the county acquired prior to, or uh, after 2004. So I'm just going to go through a few photographs. Um, these are Tucson Mountain Park, which actually created all the way back in uh, the 1920s by the County Board of Supervisors. Inigo Creek Natural Preserve, crown jewel, I think, of, of, our, of, of uh, our reserve system. It occurs just outside of Tucson. It's just a lovely place. Um, but it was really 2004 uh, bond measure that was passed by the voters of Pima County to acquire all those other lands that I showed you in red. So we, we acquired a lot of lands in fee title, as well as purchased a lot of uh, state grazing leases. So I'm just going to just highlight that a lot of these lands were ranches and active cattle ranches. And um, there are 50, 15 of them here. And um, they remain uh, active cattle ranches with the exception of there's, there's no cattle right now. Carpenter Ranch, but um, for the most part, they are active cattle ranching operations. Um, we place a great emphasis during the SDCP process on communicating with the ranch community. Um, and th there, there was a lot of sort of mistrust about what our motivations were at the time. You know, were we going to buy this land and lock the ranchers out? And we, of course, have not done that. And, and I think it really speaks to the, the ranchers themselves and who these folks are that a lot of them were, you know, got a pretty sizable chunk of money from Pima County. And a lot of them could have just walked away, but they didn't. They stayed uh, for the most part. Um, they, they still ranch these lands. They're still partners with us in conservation of these lands, and they're just a really, really critical component of this plan. And I just want to emphasize that. Um, and so I'm just going to do uh, run through a few photographs of these lands. Hopefully there's not too much of a delay here. I'm just kind of run through them uh, fairly quickly. The Sands Ranch is some of our better um, grasslands. This is down in the Sonoida Valley. Six Bar Ranch is on the east side of the Santa Catalina Mountains. Rancho Seco is down by Aravaca near the Santa Cruz, near Santa Cruz County. There's an aerial photograph of Rancho Seco and the Marley Ranch. I'll talk about Marley Ranch right at the very end. Um, A7 in the foreground with the uh, Saguaro National Park uh, Rincon Mountain District in the background. Wine Ranch, another grassland ranch in the Sonoida Valley. So here's a map of the uh, county preserves that, that we have purchased slash leased um, to date. Now these are, when you're looking at the red here, this, these are both state and private lands combined. Um, so but you can see how they relate to the to the Forest Service, the BLM, and the Fish and Wildlife Service reserves that are occur in Pima County. And there's also a layer of elevation here just to kind of show you um, most of the county um, preserve lands occur in sort of the lower to mid-elevation areas, and they really kind of bridge, bridge these reserves. For example, if you see over here at Bar B Ranch and Cienega Creek Preserve and Colossal Cave Mountain Park, you can, in a few other parcels, you can see the, the important sort of landscape linkages that are made as well. You can see Rancho Seco here. I'll talk a little bit later about Marley Ranch, which is a, a potential acquisition in the future here. So you can see that 
you know, the importance of the county lands and, and just, just how much, you know, land that we, we own and, and lease now and the importance of that and sort of stitching this, this landscape back together in terms of long-term conservation. So if we think about the future and potential acquisitions, this is the sort of universe of potential acquisition and leases. Um, this is what we know, we call the habitat protection priorities. Um, these are private lands in red, state lands in blue um, that are potential for acquisition. So we have done a fair amount of acquisition in the past. We look forward into the future to more acquisitions potentially. And again, I'll talk about that in a little while. But if we throw all of this together into sort of a potential reserve system, we see that we can gain a lot of sort of representation within, if we, if we combine sort of think about the federal, the state, the county land, the, the, the private lands which are currently open space, and we see the importance of, of you know, of, of these different elements, the county lands primarily in the lower elevation areas, contributing to conservation in the region. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears one more time here, and I'm going to talk about the, the MSCP, the Multi-Species Conservation Plan, and its relationship to the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. And you can sort of think of the SDCP as kind of the, the big umbrella, and, it's, and underneath that umbrella is a cultural resource um, component of the SDCP. We have cultural resource staff that are, that are actively, you know, engaged in cultural resource preservation, and, and we have um, a lot of other elements, a lot of other ordinances that are enforced to, to, to bolster and, and the SDCP, but the MSCP is specifically related to endangered species. Remember, this was, this was kind of the reason for, for the beginnings of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. Now, under Section nine of the ESA, you can't harass, and kill, and harm endangered species. Um, but under section 10, it says you actually can do that. You can harm habitat of endangered species, but in exchange for that, um, that shielding from section nine, you, you um, need to provide avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures of the species that you're going to impact. And that's what an HCP, or Habitat Conservation Plan, is. And the MSDP is our version, the Multi-Species Conservation Plan. Uh, we did receive federal funding for planning for the MSDP, um, but the real value is it provides regulatory certainty. So if you develop an HCP, the time period in which you, you state in your, your, the term of your permit, um, you receive protection from future listings of, of species as well as any future uh, requirements by the federal government to provide mitigation or um, any kind of you know, comp compensatory mitigation or any other rules related to monitoring or anything like that. So, so again, this, this plan is it's, it's very comprehensive and it has, for us, for Pima County, we're covering 44 species. Currently 11 are listed, two just in the last year have been listed, the, the yellow-billed cuckoo and the Mexican garter snake were finalized their listings. But additional listings are also possible. So we have, for example, everyone on everyone's mind right now is the Sonoran Desert tortoise, but others Others could be listed as well. So there's 33 uh, additional species uh, on our list. Now, if during the course of our 30-year permit, some of these species are some of these species are listed, um, there'll be no additional conservation measures that the county would be required to put forward. So ours is a 30-year permit term, and it's covering 36,000 acres of development. And this is both from the public and the private sector. So the county does a lot of road building and, uh, and sewer, sewer uh, 
infrastructure work. So that will cover our development. It also covers um, some types of private development so that when a developer uh, wants to develop a large area of land, they don't have to go to the Fish and Wildlife Service and try to negotiate their own habitat conservation plan or their own Section 7 sort of consultation. Um, they will come underneath our plan and gain the protections um, that, that, we are, that we are putting into the plan. In exchange for that, as I mentioned, we need avoidance minimization and mitigation. Well, I've described to you about the, the mitigation that we've already, we've already implemented under the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. And that's one of the things that's kind of unique about Pima County's um, MSTP or HTP is that um, unlike most HTPs which sort of get signed off on with the promise to mitigate for, act, for development activities as they occur, we actually have most of the mitigation that we need kind of in the bank, if you will, um, so that future, future impacts will be mitigated using the, the preserve system that we have um, that we've acquired so far. Um, but we're also using that CLS in terms of determining how much mitigation we need. So if one acre of development occurs in the biological core, we actually will mitigate five acres of land um, using that CLS using that CLS ratio. So um, Actually, it's a little bit higher, not to get into the weeds, it's a little bit higher than the, than the CLS ratio, but it's very similar. Um, so uh, in addition to the mitigation side, we also have management and monitoring responsibilities. Um, one of my main jobs with the county is uh, development of the monitoring program and soon to be implementation because as you can see at the bottom, we're really hoping for permit issuance by the end of this year. We've been doing this for a long time, um, and I fear putting even a date on a, on, a, on a PowerPoint presentation, but we really are coming down to really dealing with smaller issues. The, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is currently developing their biological opinion, um, and so we're really very, uh, very hopeful to have it done by the end of the year or very latest, uh, early next year. So. It's been a long planning process. We've been at this for about 15 years. I think we've got a we've got a formula to, that we've kind of got it right, um, and the development community um, is going to gain some protections and some benefits under this as well. So, um, so I think it's I think it's a good package going forward. And I just want to um, just end with just a, a couple little things. We're going to swing back to a couple. Um, a couple items in a little bit here, but I just want to just say that the, the FDCP, I think, really, really brought forward the idea that conservation is not just a drain economically. We, we have placed a great importance here at Pima County on economic development, and we recognize the importance of development in our, you know, in the, it, it, Excuse me. We recognize the importance of a of sort of a vibrant economy to to support uh, conservation measures. We also recognize the importance of conservation for um, for uh, from the economic perspective. So, for example, a more compact urban form. Um, what I mean by that is that if we create a if most citizens are kind of living within a smaller area. It's much easier for us to provide services, for emergency services, sewer services, um, health services, um, sheriff safety, you know, uh, services, than if everyone was sort of spread out thinly across the landscape. So we see it very much from a cost perspective of how much would it cost Pima County to provide services to different areas, and that was a key driver in the Sonar Desert Conservation Plan, a key consideration. When we think about watershed protection and protecting watersheds, um, we don't have to spend as much money on flood protection if we um, if we protect watersheds. Um, county residents who need to buy, buy flood insurance actually pay 25% less 
because of the conservation measures that the county has implemented. So these are real cost benefits. And if we think even broader, so the creation of larger reserves, the adding, adding open space and, and continuity between the federal reserve and the county reserve, we see recreational opportunities. And those have health benefits. And those have, we know that the health benefits, that's real, that's real cost, that's important cost benefit in, in addition to kind of quality of life. We see benefits to tourism. So I just want to put this economic piece out there because it is it is an important one. You know, we're still not kind of out of the downturn yet, but we need to remember that that you know the old paradigm of of thinking about open space land as just sort of a future development um, doesn't doesn't play that well um, anymore necessarily um, in the equation of sort of from the economic perspective. So um, these are just some of the other lessons uh, lessons learned from the FDCP um, that you know environmental compliance we consider it to be kind of the, the sort of the ground floor of conservation measures that we can uh, we can do better than that and and that's what we strove to do. Um, science um, is the sort of planning advisory um, that scientific process that planning model building. Um, was really as robust and withstood a lot of sort of scrutiny from experts and so forth to be as to be as solid as possible. It was also that the scientific process was really shielded from the larger political and social debate that was happening around other SDCP elements at the time, and that and that science was really kind of shielded from that from that process. So we think about. We think about the big picture um, in terms of conservation, but you know it happens by small steps, by small actions, um, like purchases of land, like the building of relationships. And speaking of people, I mean, citizen and stakeholder involvement was really, really important. Um, and both the steering committee, um, as well as just citizens, who said, "Hey, you know, this is really important. Conservation is really." Um, important value, um, and and they were very actively involved in the SDCP process. And I also want to just say that 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 um, the board of supervisors um, is a bipartisan board, and especially during the, the day of uh, development, was a um, was a, there are two Republicans and, and, and three Democrats that really actively supported the SDCP. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, it doesn't have to be one party or the other sort of carrying the conservation banner. Um, so it was that was really that was really amazing leadership, um, both from the board and and the county supervisor's office. So um, that was that was a big that was a big and important piece of it. And finally, just thinking about the future, um, this coming November. There are a series of bond measures on the ballot. Um, one of them is for natural open space protection, and there's $95 million um, that most of which would go to the Marley Ranch. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. This is uh, there's about 15,000 acres of fee land and about um, 85,000 acres of state trust land in this ranch um, that, if purchased, if the bond measure passes. Um, would really create a very, you know, contiguous um, reserve you know, along the Sierra Mountains and the, uh, the east side of the Altar Valley and, and, and west side of the Santa Cruz Valley. So um, that land would also be used for um, mitigation for the multi-species conservation plan. So that is, uh, I think that is, that is my talk. So I will open it up. I think the questions, is that correct, Genevieve? I'm, yes. I'm um, thanks, Brian. That was really great. And um, I think it shows how we can definitely look at uh, county level land use planning to achieve some conservation goals on um, across even bigger landscapes. Um, 
So we do have time for questions. You can either use the chat function um, on the webinar. There's a little round blurb um, at the top of your screen. Um, or if you'd like to verbally ask a question, you can press star six to unmute your phone. Um, and we do currently have one question from Joanna for you, Brian, which is how are you tackling monitoring requirements for the MSCP? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so we're doing things a little bit differently from most, from most HDPs, which typically focus on monitoring individual species that are covered under the permit. Well, we have 44 species. Um, some of them are, we can monitor fairly easily. Some are just really, um, you know, challenging to monitor. Um, so what we've done is we sort of struck a balance, I think. We said, okay, we have 16 species. Um, that we feel like we could monitor well, and um, and we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to monitor 16 of the species, but we're also going to kind of take some broader perspectives. That is, looking at habitat, so monitoring vegetation change, um, monitoring, and then even pulling out further from there, monitoring landscape change, uh, water resources, key habitat features like water resources, the caves and mines. Um, so it's a real mix of, of monitoring elements that we feel strongly that would do, um, do a better job of kind of looking at change than sort of individual species level, which, which they, they, you know, there's issues with lag times for species response to environmental change. So um, that, that's our general approach. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, and um, any other questions um, either on chat or, again, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, you just have to press star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, while people think just a little bit, um, I have a question for you, Brian, which is that um, in the areas that you have set aside conservation easement requirements, uh, how has that been received by developers, and um, have you seen already an effect on property values in those areas? Well, um, okay, so right now we have not placed um, conservation easements on the lands that we purchased, um, and um, and, and we will, as we go forward with the MSCP and the, as impacts occur, we will then go out to our, our land base that we have and start placing conservation easements on those lands. Um, and, but but that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and so your second part of your question was how has, um, so I guess it hasn't really been received by the development community. I mean, there, in order for some of the developments to gain access to the benefits of the permit, um, some of those natural open spaces will have to have some kind of long-term protection. Um, those developments, that is, uh, excuse me, the open space next to um, some of those developments. So there will have to be a, an instrument on those lands. Great. Thank you. Um, and we have another question, which is, please tell us more about the Marley Ranch and the species found there and the connectivity this would provide. Yeah, the Marley Ranch, um, so we don't know all of what occurs there, though, um, though we imagine that there is a, a fair number of you know, pineapple cactus and that that would provide um, sort of a, a connectivity corridor between the Altar Valley to the west and the Santa Cruz Valley uh, to the east. So that's a really exciting possibility there. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, the, this is uh, semi-desert grassland and desert scrub, so we're going to have, uh, we could have box turtle, with Swainson's hawk, um, there's potential for reintroduction of uh, Chiricahua leopard frog. There, there, um, uh, I mentioned Pima pineapple cactus. Great, thank you. 
Um, and then I have um, another question. Um, you, I think you sort of alluded to the idea that, you know, there was a lot of momentum to not plan for just one species. Um, but I'm sure that other um, efforts have had that same idea, and yet it seemed to be really successful and take off in Pima County. Um, was there um, maybe a person, or what really was sort of the catalyst maybe that um, allowed for that change to take place and plan for multiple species across the full county? Well, I, I think I think it really the environment, um, the social environment at the time was really, um, you know, there were a lot of developments that were being proposed and being passed by the, the county board of supervisors um, that, that didn't provide, um, in a lot of people's opinion, sort of an open space or there was a lot of contention over some development. And um, so I think that um, at the time, there was just a general kind of concern uh, about conservation. And I think, again, there's this realization that, you know, we live in this biologically rich region and, um, and, and we, there, there, is a, there, there, there is a better way. Now, a lot of these planning processes that get, that get started, um, you know, with relationships and individual decisions, and certainly um, the county administrator, you know, maybe uh, Behan, um, some folks even at the Fish and Wildlife Service who, you know, said, "Hey, look, there is this alternative way um, that you could that you could um, have your development and, and and have certainty in the development community um, in exchange for conservation measures, and then from there um, broadened it out to that community community conversation." So there were definitely some key players. Um, but it was also then became sort of a community conversation. And I think, you know, having that steering committee and the citizen involvement in, in many different forums provided for a sort of shared experience around the idea of conservation and, 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 and the possibilities therein. Thank you, Brian. Um, we have another question, which is, in retrospect, do you still like the emphasis on riparian areas and species? Absolutely. Uh, every every day, I think it's just so critical. I mean, we're we're in we're in the 15th year of a, a severe drought, and we're seeing um, the impact of that drought on uh, on aquatic and riparian areas. So they're be becoming even more valuable, and and we're seeing that from you know not just our work but other work of our partners. The Sky on the Lions is focusing on spring. Um, Nature Conservancy is focusing on on aquatic and riparian resources. So they will they will always be and should be uh, a focus on aquatic and riparian systems. But we have to remember, of course, that they're they're integrated with the uplands as well, and for, for you know loss of the uplands and the de degradation of the uplands um, will have, and you know groundwater pumping and so forth will will have continue to have uh, impacts on our riparian areas. So we kind of think of the system as a whole, but the riparian aquatic systems as as a as a focal you know, laser focus on that as, as being really really critical. Great, thank you. Other questions from folks on the phone? We do have one more question from Dwayne. Um, but Dwayne, I apologize, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> um, if you can press star six and unmute yourself, you could ask. Brian directly. Hi, this is Dwayne Poole. I had a question over um, the use of, you know, the 44 species that you had and the yeah. fact that it seemed that you had adequate data at the scale at which you were doing your analyses. Is there a point at which from what you've learned that you would start to say that indicators are probably appropriate 
to help narrow down the amount of information needed to go into a comprehensive plan, or is it worth the, I guess, additional effort that it takes to include all 44 species, even though there might be some significant overlaps between the habitat or condition needs of those species? Um, let me sure, make sure I understand your question. So if I could just paraphrase, um, so you, you're saying there's sort of redundancy in the species themselves in our plan, and um, if, if that redundancy makes any sense. Um, well, I mean, when it comes down to it, the Fish and Wildlife Service sort of thinks about things on a species by species basis, so that if we, for example, were only to cover the Chiricahua leopard frog and the lowland leopard frog were uh, to, be, to be listed, um, that wouldn't provide us with any protections, even though there might be some overlap um, in, their, um, in their habitat. I think where the overlap comes uh, in handy is kind of relating, again, to that monitoring element, where if, because we're monitoring all the perennial water sources on natural perennial water sources on county lands, that we can then, you know, we, we can then be watching out for that key habitat element that would cover those species and others. So is that is that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. It's I, I hadn't considered the fact that you have to respond specifically to species as opposed yeah. to just the of developing a spatial design. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Dwayne. I knew you could state that much better than I could. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Lacey, which is, are you aware of any other counties, um, either in Arizona or other states, that are doing similar plans? Well, um, I, I know that right now that, uh, for example, Pinal County in Arizona is, doing a, is, is looking at open space um, planning, um, and there are probably other folks on the line that could answer that better for me uh, than me. Um, um, but there have been a few papers out in the last few years about, you know, what, um, what counties are doing in terms of um, integrating conservation into their planning processes. Um, and I could provide that, 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 those citations. I don't have them off the top of my head, but, um, but, um, but there, are other, there are other counties. And I know Maricopa County, for example, has, an, has open space um, preserves. Um, up there in, around Phoenix, so um, I think in terms of the level of sort of comprehensiveness, um, not yet, but I think that a lot of um, counties are really seeing the natural environment as sort of an amenity and as a, as a necessity, um, both, both of those things, so I don't have any specifics for you. Um, and then we have time for just one more question, which is um, if you could um, tell us a little bit more about the types of agreements you have with livestock producers to continue ranching on the acquired lands. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad that's asked. Yeah, we have a ranch um, management agreement with, with all of the operators, which sort of spells out, um, you know, the different, um, different responsibilities. And so each of the ranch operators um, have, we have a separate agreement with them, um, their termed agreement, um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think for the most part, um, we really, um, you know, have mutual, mutual goals um, at the end of the day. Of course, we also really uh, want to focus on the land conservation and make sure that the conservation piece is in place. But, that also gets to the uh, importance of a healthy landscape, both for species and for the livestock producers and, um, and their bottom line. So um, it just it really varies by, by the operator. Great. Thank you. Um, we are out of time today. So again, thank you, Brian, for your presentation today. Um, I think it was really informative. If people have additional questions, um, are they able to email you or? Yeah, you bet. They are. Yep, Brian. That's with Brian with an I. Dot Powell at Pima. Dot Gov. I'd be happy to answer any questions, concerns, uh, anything. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. 
Um, and then just to remind um, everybody, we are recording the webinar. Um, we will be posting it to the Desert LCC YouTube channel um, in, in about uh, a week or two, and so we'll get that up. Um, you'll have access to that. Um, just go to YouTube and search Desert LCC. You can see all of our webinars that we've presented so far. Thank you again, um, Brian, for being on today. Thank you, everybody, for participating and making the time to be with us. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free also to contact me at gjohnson at usbr.gov. You can get all of our information on the Desert LCC website as well. So thank you.